groups who have priorities and things that they'd like to see either approved or modified or added or subtracted from the farm bill to keep in mind that the budget constraints were under. Low commodity prices obviously are going to factor into the way a lot of groups in sort of the urgency behind the farm bill. 50% drop since we wrote the 2014 farm bill. Some of that's reflected in land values at this point. The margins are a little bit squeezed in a way that we didn't really have during the last farm bill when prices were quite good. Exports are also up, so we don't have quite the same crisis that we did during the commodity downturn in the 80s, but nevertheless, we're starting to get a little bit pinched. So our agriculture risk coverage and the price loss coverage programs, these are two Title I, as they're called, commodity programs of the farm bill, are definitely going to be a big point of interest. One of the challenges we have, just while we're kind of walking through sort of item by item that I've flagged on this sheet of paper as being interesting, dairy. You know, dairy prices have been quite low for a little while. They started to rebound in very recent months, but they've had several years of depressed prices. And so this has sort of put a microscope on their risk management and what they'd like to see out of the farm bill. And this is going to be a big, big fight, inevitably, in the farm bill, one that can be, I think, resolved in a dignified way, but nevertheless, it's going to be a big fight, as it always is in every farm bill. And so there's going to be folks who want to change what's called the margin protection program or perhaps come up with some other solution. But in any case, you can anticipate that dairy farmers are going to be very interested in this particular farm bill. And there's not as much of this next commodity in Colorado, but just so you know what kind of constraints are under, cotton has a lot of concerns going on. You know, they've also had very low prices for a while. The international market for cotton is bizarre. And so those guys definitely have had a rough few years when it comes to sort of market conditions. And so they're also looking to have their policy revisited in the farm bill. So dairy and cotton are kind of the two big commodity things. Credit is something that we're going to have to keep an eye on. It's a smaller part of the farm bill. The farm bill can authorize USDA to extend operating loans and ownership loans, both kind of direct and guaranteed. And I think we're going to also, outside of the farm bill, have to keep an eye on the farm credit system right now. Capitalization is quite good. We don't see any particular outstanding problems there, but it is going to be something that we have to watch for all the reasons that Rod had laid out earlier. It was just a unique moment in our farm economy. Things are going to get a little bit tougher, and we just need to be extra vigilant on the farm credit system and also the authorization levels at USDA to make sure that to um, you know, worthy borrowers there is um, there's capital to go around so folks can keep doing what they what they do best. Um, we're also you know something to keep an eye on the next farm bill uh, conservation program. Um, this last year or this last farm bill, excuse me, uh, featured the first uh, time in which we spent more money on conservation than we did on the commodity program. And this is for a variety of reasons, but if you look at it from a Western perspective, uh, I think that actually reflects where a lot of the uh, concerns have been that um, you know, we've heard over time working with, with Western offices, and certainly when I was in the Bend office, we heard a lot about water quality issues, water quantity issues, and making sure that we had voluntary tools available to help folks um, not only manage that stuff and their soil health and their water quality, but also avoid potential regulation. This is one of the tools we have to get people to a place where they don't feel like, or, the, or where they were to have a little bit of buffer between where their operation stands and what the law, um, the letter of the law says. Um, another thing to watch out for more broadly, um, this is sort of a, um, a, a, a political science exercise of the nutrition program. Um, in addition to being very, very important for the folks who do rely on um, nutrition, um, and, and, that, and SNAP is the most obvious example of that, it's been referred to in the past as food stamps, um, it is absolutely vital to have uh, sort of a national food policy and to have our commodity programs linked with the nutrition program. And I say that because, you know, anyone, everyone sitting in that room knows how fewer and fewer people now are directly involved in agriculture, and it becomes harder to 
uh, methods to folks why agriculture is a unique industry and also a vital industry and why we need to at least every five years as the farm bills are you know, revisit our policy and, and make sure folks are, are, um, are healthy in the countryside. Um, that's, again, it's becoming a lot harder, whereas nutrition, it just tends to, it, that's, a, that's an alliance that serves as well because there are so many members now in the way districts are drawn that have significant um, you know, populations that um, you know, due to especially the, the recent recession have relied on, on some of the nutrition programs and to help them get by on a temporary basis. And it's just one more entree into food policy for a larger group of people. And so that alliance has served as well for decades now, and I think it's going to be vital to advancing the, the farm bill this time around again. Um, I forget what the uh, exact statistics are, but you should, next time you, you have a moment in your, your, in front of your computer, take a look at the, the districts that are purely rural in the United States, and then those that have more of a uh, kind of an urban center. And there are fewer and fewer purely rural districts where folks feel like that um, farm policy really guides a lot of their, their way of thinking um, in Congress. And so I think it's something where um, agriculture, as usual, has to kind of punch above its weight and make its case to a, a larger section of people. And part of that's the partnership with uh, nutrition. Um, uh, beyond that, um, you know, we are you know, uh, going to be look, process wise, I guess, um, we haven't spoken too much about that. Uh, we will likely be, so we've had now a uh, field hearing in Kansas. The chairman of the Senate Agriculture Committee is from Kansas. And we have a hearing there with some of his producers. We will have one in the next several weeks in Michigan, which is where again, Senator Staff now is from. And then you can anticipate, I don't, you know, we don't run the show as the minority staff, uh, but nevertheless, we don't, this, again, tends to be a bipartisan process. And what we anticipate at this point is we'll have sort of sector by sector within ag uh, correlated hearings. So, you know, uh, what we did last time, for instance, is we had one on livestock, we had one on energy, we had one on the commodity programs, we had some on rural development. And so everyone gives a, a, a quick moment to discuss what's working and what's not, and, and hopefully get to a better place and even some sort of consensus on sort of the direction of the, um, the next farm bill. You guys are, you know, certainly a big part of that process. I've always appreciated the, the, the candor and the forthrightness that you guys have conveyed information um, back to me and that dates all the way back to the Bennett office. Um, and so uh, as, you know, things emerge, you all should consider yourself a very active participant in the shaping of this bill to make sure that it, it reflects what you all need. Um, you know, it only comes up every few years, and so we want to make as much of it as possible. Um, things that just immediately come to mind, this is by no means an exhaustive list uh, as far as what Western slope priorities might be, Club 20 priorities might be, but I mentioned conservation a little bit earlier. Um, you know, the Regional Conservation Partnership Program it's one that I think is a, um, the, the concept has, is, is great watershed scale conservation. There's been a few difficulties. I know that I've worked personally on some of these on um, implementation. The Lower Gunnison Basin comes to mind as one where, you know, we've had a very worthy project that's taken a little bit longer than certainly I would have hoped to, uh, to have moved forward. But it's a big pot of money with a very worthy cause and it's, it's, we should figure out the way to make that work better for, um, for certainly for Western states and for Colorado. Easements have been a, are a really big thing um, in, the, in the Western slope. I think of all the um, all the beautiful orchards and uh, and other and other places, uh, ranches that um, where Senator Bennett certainly has toured in the past and has done work to help advance. That kind of stuff is going to be super important as part of the farm bill. Livestock disaster is an interesting thing. Um, you know, it, we've had sustained periods of drought in recent years in Colorado, um, and that hasn't really exempted anybody. Um, everyone's been affected by that, and so, um, you know, programs that help folks through um, uh, enduring, you know, bad forage conditions and, uh, and just kind of scorched pasture, uh, the livestock disaster programs have, have been very, very helpful um, during, uh, since the last farm bill was enacted, and um, that will be something that we need to think about going forward. Crop insurance is another obvious um, example. The last farm bill did a lot of 
expanding of crop insurance to commodities that traditionally haven't been eligible for it. And I include most of what are called specialty crops in that category, so stuff in, in your all's neck of the woods, apples, cherries, peaches, all this kind of stuff. Hasn't always been super easy to get crop insurance, but we've encouraged the risk management agency within the USDA to sort of expedite um, you know, uh, processes for, for rolling out um, programs on, on, on specialty crops to make sure that everybody feels like they have appropriate risk management tools so they're not wiped out by one bad season or a, an untimely freeze or something like that. Um, there are a number of programs, this is something to watch out for and think about is um, you all kind of figure out what you're going to advocate for and what your order of priorities are, but there's a lot of programs that are authorized in the Farm Bill, but after 2018, which is when the Farm Bill expires, this is in September, September 2018, they don't have a baseline, which means that there's no funding actually allocated for them. So once the Farm Bill expires, then they're not spoken for. And so these include things like um, voluntary public access, which um, helps facilitate um, you know, um, hunting and, and uh, activities on, on private land and, and, and make sure that that stuff's available for, for recreation. And obviously that's a, a great uh, rural economy tool. Um, energy programs, um, there's a broad variety of bioenergy programs contained in the Farm Bill and Advanced Biofuels programs. Um, all of those don't have funding once um, the farm bill expires. Value-added producer grants, that can be a big deal for um, folks who are doing innovative things and um, would like to partner with the USDA to kind of take their projects to the next level. Um, sheep grants, um, you know, on most calls, I don't know if people would be especially uh, keen on, on discussing the sheep grant program, but um, the Western Slope certainly has some, some sheep, and we've worked a lot on those issues over the years in a, in a variety of ways, but that's another example of a program that um, will be uh, not having a baseline after the expiration of the final. So that's sort of like the, I guess the lay of the land. Um, I probably gave you way too much information, uh, or perhaps it didn't come out in a, in a perfect form, but nevertheless, um, that's an overview. And if anyone has any particular questions on that stuff, or on another issue involving agriculture that you'd like to make sure that I take back and think about, um, I'm all ears. Thank you. Thanks, Grant. Appreciate that very much. Um, yes, lots of information, but thank you very much for that. Um, I think, like you say, we just open it up for questions and thoughts. If that's good with you, yep. okay. Yep. Alrighty. So, you may start. Thoughts and questions. Okay, Jay Paul. Uh, thank you. Uh, you know, one of the biggest issues that's uh, going to be facing agriculture is is our trade um, worldwide. And uh, is there anything in the farm bill addressing that? Uh, as you know, that um, we export a lot of our products, and uh, if we can't do that, that's going to be really bad for us, and it's going to be bad for the United States. Um, absolutely. Thank you for the question, Jay Paul. Um, yeah, so specific to the Farm Bill, there's a, a couple programs, the Market Access Program and the Foreign Market Development Program. And essentially what these are are ways of empowering producers and producer groups to access overseas markets. And um, that can include things like feasibility, that can include um, you know, presences at uh, you know, conferences around the world. These programs, generally speaking, are quite popular, and there's broad support for them within agriculture. They are often uh, subject to what, what we refer to around here as unfriendly amendments during uh, the you know, Senate and House debate on the Farm Bill, because folks feel like there isn't a role for um, USDA in doing this. I disagree, and I think most of agriculture disagrees, and feel like it's actually a very high use of the Department of Agriculture to um, pick up for our farmers and ranchers and enforce our trade rights and then help us uh, take advantage of, of, uh, of new ones. And so, yes, there, there's a couple things on trade generally. Um, you know, if you, if you folks do feel strongly about that issue, and I think all of agriculture should, um, trade isn't always uh, an easy conversation by any means, and 
some folks have fared better by trade than others, even within agriculture. But um, there's a lot of ambiguity over um, what exactly the new administration's plan is for trade. Often when uh, the president and his team talk about trade it's in the manufacturing context, which is you know, actually quite important, and certainly agriculture has some manufacturing going on in it as well, but I just don't hear the words agriculture often said. And so this is a great time to weigh in with um, not only your representatives, but make sure that folks who may or may not be representing you in Washington or in the state or anyone who will, uh, who will listen, who's, who's part of this, um, this larger uh, kind of the coalition, um, it's worth uh, raising the flag a little bit and make your, your voices heard on the issue um, early on here so we can, uh, we can set the right tone on that and make sure we don't take any steps backwards what overall has been quite a success story for agriculture. Great, thanks. Let's see, I think I saw, Wayne, did you have your hand? Oh, okay. All right. So I heard one back over here. Okay. So yeah, uh, Doug Munger, Route County Commissioner and also a rancher. So I, I guess, I, I guess, and I, first off, I understand that the Ag Bill is really not Ag Bill anymore because the Ag Bill is mostly a subsistence, you know, and the rest and the food bill and the rest that all get mixed in there. I guess, you know, I'm, I'm really concerned about the future of agriculture in this whole. We, we sat here and talked about the uh, ag credit situation coming up and the rest. And, and what difference does credit make if you don't have prices that subsist, sub, that uh, will support the credit? I mean, nobody's going to borrow money when the prices are in the tank the way they are right now. And it's across the board, whether it's in the beef business, the corn business, and the rest. We're already talking about 1% of the... Uh, of the uh, American public or, or ag people and ranch people, and yet the whole business, all of it is about ready to implode because of the low prices. And, and, and again, we, can't, we don't need credit, we, we need to have some price stability. And insurance programs don't do any good when the prices are so low, it's not sustainable in the first place either. So I guess, you know, I, I, and I don't know why, there's, there's too, way too much, um, things being played here on agriculture with the outside gambling that gets done with Chicago Mercantile and the rest and all those things that go on. So some, sometime, somewhere soon, somebody's going to have to come to reckoning here how us people are going to provide the food for the next generation. So, um, Loud and clear, I mean, that's a, uh, Commissioner, that is a, a very good point, and I, there isn't a perfect solution to attend to that and if we did we wouldn't probably be having the conversation and it's um, you know agriculture is cyclical um, in, in many ways it doesn't mean we don't have some structural challenges but um, you know just given the tool before us which is the, the, the farm bill we try and write these things for the bad times rather than the good times and I think um, you know as we as we evolve in the way in which we think about our, our food system you know I think we just have to make sure that uh, the tools that we do have available are, are working as well as they can. I mean, for, for some folks, I mean, up in, um, up in your area, but, you know, around Colorado, part of that's been being able to take advantage of local markets and some value-added stuff and um, roadside stands. You know, I, there's all sorts of creativity going on that um, I think 30 years ago we definitely would not have seen. Exports have actually been helpful, stabilizing prices in some ways. And, again, that's won't solve everything in itself, but certainly um, we've seen um, you know, prices supported by the fact that we have places to put our products and we have uh, customers willing to pay a premium for uh, products from the United States, which has a very good reputation internationally for quality, safety, and abundance. You know, crop insurance, you know, again, as you mentioned, not a, not a permanent solution, especially when the underlying economics and financials aren't um, in a good place, but it's at least, it's at least something. And you don't uh, you don't find too many uh, at least row crop guys. You know, I'll, I'll let Bruce speak on behalf of the peach farmers and the uh, the apple guys and stuff like that. But um, crop insurance is you know emerging more and more as kind of the cornerstone of the the farmer safety net, and um, it's also going to have to be something that we work as well. But to the extent you have um, you know ideas on um, some of these underlying dynamics and want to think in a um, you know, innovative in a broader way about this stuff, um, would be happy to connect on that stuff for sure. Great, thanks. So, uh, one more, Kelly. Oh, okay. sorry. Oh, go ahead, Mary. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, yeah. 
Just want to, last time during, this is Robin LaValle, I just wanted to, to reiterate, last time when the Farm Bill was being discussed, uh, there was an end run that was played against the Ag Experiment Station in Dubois, Idaho for sheep. And it's very critical that we don't see that uh, behind the scenes. We'll just remove all the funding from a particular sheep experiment station within the USDA budget to meet a political agenda. And so we would just ask for that continued support that not only do you help us bird dog that if you start to see that occur, but you uh, fight back on that significantly because it does have a real impact for sheep producers, not only in Western Colorado, but across the West. Thank you, Robbie. Loud and clear on that as well. Um, I encourage you, and I'll flag it, and I know that um, you've got the right people from the Ben's office, and it sounds like um, Congressman Tipton's office in the room, and definitely encourage you also to reach out um, to your partners in Idaho and as well as in Montana. Um, you know, this is kind of a Rocky Mountain West-centric um, um, issue uh, in some ways, and so that's going to be, I think, a, a strong alliance to help um, protect what's going on there, and I, I agree. That sort of thing shouldn't be a political football. Thanks. Harry. Yeah, this is Harry Perulis. I, I maybe no one can answer this question, but I'm curious, my, my past experience has said that we can't just ask a question at a town hall meeting and expect that to be input towards uh, an ag bill. What kind of venue can we set up? You said you want to hear from all the factions uh, that are involved in the Farm Bill. What kind of venue could we actually set up where we could create some accountability or at least create some debate as to the importance of some of these issues? So, uh, for example, livestock. How, how, how can we actually look at the Ag Committee and talk to them rather than talking to staff or asking a question at a town hall meeting. I, I, I really think for us in agriculture, like Robbie said and like uh, Commissioner Monger said, we're, we're, we're seeing the sunset. And, and if we don't take us serious, then, then imports aren't going to be, we're not going to be exporting, we're going to be importing all of agriculture. Because we're seeing this turn into a, a sunset for agriculture. And along that line, all the subjects, uh, I, I'd like to, I'm, I'm assuming the tax reform means not only the income tax, but the uh, death tax, inheritance tax, and the protection of family farms. And uh, we can't begin to talk about immigration. Those of us in the sheep business can't compete with. Uh, the Googles, uh, they're interested in H-1B visas, and that's why they're in uproar over immigration. We're interested in help uh, to pick crops and to uh, herd sheep. So I really think that, that putting the right people at the table to have a debate and have those of us in the trenches have a, a word to say other than some uh, chairman from General Mills uh, testifying in Washington telling us how great they're, they're doing. Uh, with uh, our oats and our wheat. Harry, Harry, let me let me try and take that, and then I'll pass it over to Grant and Lee to finish it up. Um, I think it's, I think it's a fair question. I think we're you know we're working to try and figure out how we can help you know have have those discussions in, in, in the right way. Um, I'll follow up with you after this because I'd be interested in your thoughts specifically about how we can do that. I mean, I think we're we're starting by trying to have this kind of you know we we've, we've kind of I, I I think that we. We've got the two main prongs of how we're going to do this here on the phone. You know, Lee, who's going to be doing this in the state, and then Grant, who's going to be kind of our go-to in D.C. working on this. And, um, and you know, and, and they and I are going to be talking to people all over the state. And Lee is going to be doing, like I said, going on, a, you know, quite a trip to try and uh, connect with as many people as we can, both, you know, folks that we know here in the state have issues and also trying to open it up and make sure that folks from the public feel like they can come in and have a say. We're still working to figure out how the senator's schedule is going to match with all this. His schedule right now is a moving target. We still are trying to figure out what days we're going to be free and what days we he's going to be in D.C. this spring. Um, but then I think the other part of the answer is we'd be interested in hearing from you all. You know, if, if, if you know who the right people are and you can help us put them in a room, we'll be there. You know, because and, and we want to hear what you have to say. And, um, and I think in some cases, folks like you on the ground, you know who the group is that we need to be talking to better than we can kind of pull together from our existing context. Um, and that would be really helpful. So, so, so let's keep up on that here in the state. And then Grant and Lee, I don't know if you have anything else to add on that. Maybe we just lost him. 
Um, one, one, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, yeah, it did break for a moment. But to, I think Noah's exactly right. Um, but one, one thing I, I certainly, you know, a couple of things that you, um, you had mentioned that um, I think warrant a little follow up. Do not underestimate the, um, the sincerity and the importance of, of, of working with staff. Uh, you know, the member cannot always be there. Michael's a great guy, and certainly Congressman Tipton, I'm sure, wants to be at every meeting. Um, but, you know, staff is, is honestly where a lot of these conversations begin. And the folks uh, in an office who tend to spend the most time on a single issue because, frankly, that's what they're there for. Um, they're there to think about uh, ways of channeling what it is the Western Slope, what it is the call, what it is Colorado needs into their thinking on a, on a bill when it's put in front of them. And so, I mean, last time around, and every, you know, every, every single, you know, bill and every initiative is a little bit different, but last time around, just because I was part of it, I can speak to that, you know, um, Michael and his team went around to different areas of the state and had meetings, and um, it's because folks like you identified the right people or showed up yourself to sit down and talk through what you're experiencing, what, you know, hasn't worked within the farm bill, um, ideas uh, for improvement and stuff that you frankly just don't want us to touch, you say it's working fine, and we, we kind of move on from there. But, um, you know, those, those sorts of interactions are the only way to, you know, that, I mean, that is the way, that is the way you, you, you communicate and you get your, your thoughts back. If you're part of a larger, uh, either a trade association or you have sort of a, a network of folks that you, 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 you team up with in order to kind of advance your, your collective interests, you know, that's also a way to, to make a difference. Is make sure you're, you're talking to, um, you know, your association heads and folks like that to identify what specifically you're, you're experiencing in your, you know, particular neck of the woods. And um, that information will, will translate as well. But you should always feel free to loop in, and, and you should, frankly, loop in your, um, your, your representatives, your federal representatives, um, when you have ideas about how to make things better or um, whatever council you might have going forward. On the immigration issue, real fast, um, I know this is always a this is a perennial um, topic at, at Club 20, and is um, is uh, in a very unique situation in a way uh, now. But um, it, this is again, I guess, that perennial reminder that you actually don't have to accept the immigration conversation as it often comes out of out of Washington, which is um, that you have. Uh, and we can't solve all the different issues going on within immigration and that we can't walk and chew gum when it comes to all the different concerns we're seeing. And agriculture, in my view, is, is such a, an obvious example of, of what's not working. And when there's a completely, uh, I don't want to say obvious solution, but a very reasonable solution that had consensus-based support, Senator Bennett and a number of others were, of course, part of the Gang of Eight. Um, in 2013 that passed a comprehensive immigration bill, three-year visas, renewable, um, after that um, broke down the silos between different disciplines within agriculture so folks could um, to, uh, would have a little bit of mobility and flexibility depending on you know, the unique nature of growing seasons and, and stuff like that. So in, in that same bill, by the way, um, would have secured the border, of course. And so you don't have to accept the current discourse on immigration. And somebody says, well, we can't move on agriculture until we secure the border. We figured out how to do it once in a bipartisan way with the majority of the Senate. In fact, a supermajority of the Senate. Uh, this is actually very achievable. But we do have to, um, again, uh, you go back to your your representatives and recommit yourself to kind of telling your story because no one else um, can, can do that on your behalf. It's so important that your unique situation be conveyed to your, your representatives and, and, and demand action on this issue and in a way that will, will move the conversation forward rather than um, finding a reason not to do something. And you all have been the tip of the spear on that. And it's um, something certainly that we have noticed back here in, in, in Washington and has um, it's been very effective in the past. Thanks. I'm here with Rachel and then to Carlisle. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, a couple of fairly quick uh, comments and then a question. One is I want us all to bear in mind that the sequester of past years has really led to significant cuts in many programs, including SNAP. And uh, I know that in our community, 
and I think across the West, we have a lot of residents who depend on food banks and charities already, and, and that's an overwhelming need. And a great number of the people who are on SNAP are seniors on fixed income and children. And when you get down to the cycle of life, they're using the SNAP food stamps <coughs> to buy agricultural products. So it, it lets, I think that's why those were always linked together in the past. The second is I really wanted to uh, uh, applaud Jake Paul and others who've made the point about how the trade wars could really affect uh, agriculture in Colorado. Uh, there was an article just uh, a couple of weeks ago with a uh, Mexican senator, Armando Rios Peter, who is introducing a bill to require the country to stop buying corn from the U.S. and shift those purchases to Brazil and Argentina. And so while the trade war may be a quote about manufacturing and auto parts, um, they're taking it as a lot more than that, and especially with the negative uh, connotations that are given to the people of Mexico. So I think we're really playing with fire here, and we need to make sure that, I've also read that in separate reports, it's starting to affect the cattle industry, because they do not want to buy American beef anymore. So, you know, we have to be careful we're playing with fire there. Um, my question is, uh, does the Farm Bill, is that the funding source, and does it affect, you talked about programs that may be discontinued or unfunded in the future, uh, the Rural Water Association, that uh, there's a Rural Water Association in all 50 states, and they do the um, certification and training for rural wastewater operators and source water protection. Is that included in the Farm Bill? Is that being defunded? Uh, where do we go with that? Um, it is not being defunded. Um, it has, in the clinical way of describing it, it has a baseline. Um, you know, that said, uh, it is a, a fight every single time over what those levels are like, and uh, certainly would encourage you, you all to, um, to wait on that. I think that's a great hook for engaging a lot of folks on, um, on, this, on this issue. They're part of the Farm Bill Coalition, and um, you know, this is a, an administration that reports to value very significantly the idea that we have um, good, modern, you know, dignified infrastructure in the United States, and I think rural is a very big part of that. So um, I say go for it, and, and, if that's, and if that's a priority. Um, you know, make sure that's part of your 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 message here over the next uh, few months. And certainly, I'm I've noted that it sounds like it's important, and I know it is. Thank you. Thank you, Carlisle, and then we'll go to Bruce, and we'll see what's back behind us. Thank you, it's Carlisle Courier. Uh, first of all, I, I wanted to just add to what Jake Paul asked you, and, and give my encouragement to uh, increasing the F and D and M A P funding. We've watched exports of, of beef in our country go from less than one percent of our production 25 years ago to 14 percent last year. Uh, pork increased in even more dramatically to nearly 25% last year. Uh, FMD and MAP funding has played major roles in that and, and being able to leverage that and the government support against with our our personal checkoff funding and, and industry funding that we put in those efforts. Uh, it's very important to Western Colorado as we see our domestic beef production increase uh, after the, we recovered from the drought of the last uh, decade to, to be able to export those products to other markets and uh, we want to really emphasize that uh, we need that that help in exporting those products to those programs. Um, a question I had uh, more on the, on the actual status of the farm bill, I heard some rumors last week that there may be an effort particularly by those on the more interested in the nutrition side of the program to to just tweak the existing farm bill and extend it for a few years rather than going through the process of, of writing a new farm bill. Um, I know the chairs of both the Senate and House Ag Committees are, are strongly opposed to that. Uh, they want to do a full-fledged uh, rewrite of the farm bill. I just uh, was curious what you're he hearing on that issue. Um, great question. First, I hear you on, on MAP and FMD. I will, I will take that back. Uh, on the Farm Bill, you know, we are certainly of the mind that it's in everybody's interest, um, certainly all the members of the committee and the, and the Senate, but also for rural communities and farmers and ranchers to revisit this. 
um, revisit the bill for that. Um, you know, honestly, it's, it's a great way of, of, of forcing the body and, and encouraging folks to think very specifically about um, the countryside, even if it's only for a, a kind of a moment in time, right? It's, it's, a, it's a very important occasion to, to take a look at sort of what's working and not working when it comes to the rural economic roadmap. So um, certainly we are in the position that we need to um, move forward with the reauthorization. I don't know if it's necessarily, you know, if we're endorsing a wholesale rewrite or anything like that, but we want people to have an opportunity to weigh in on it. And certainly our members expect that. And, um, you know, I can't speak for the House, but it, 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 was, it was surprising me if they weren't feeling um, something similar. So um, as far as whether or not the nutrition community is doing, I mean, we, we hear every year of, I mean, nutrition is usually a little bit more innocent than some of them. Like we had, there have been several panels out here hosted by, by Heritage and others, um, you know, actively encouraging sort of the, um, the dissolution of the farm bill and, and, and moving beyond uh, farm policy altogether. Um, this, these kind of forces we do have to deal with their reality we face, and the only way to do it is with coalitions. And uh, frankly, you all uh, putting significant pressure on, on the system through your representatives to make sure that we stay on the right course and that um, we, we get what we need for the state. Um, so my initial thought is, yes, uh, these kind of things do flare up, and it doesn't surprise me that, that groups are talking that way. but. Um, we have ways of, 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 of counteracting that, but we, we certainly need your help to make sure that the, the coalition sticks together and that we, uh, we have a proper uh, reauthorization. Great, thanks. Bruce? This is Bruce Talbot. And, uh, there. Okay, I'm back. <laughs> this is Bruce Talbot, and I just wanted to throw something out as food for thought. Uh, Coming from last week's Farm Bureau meetings, uh, you know, the Gang of Eight and what we're trying to do in a quality guest worker program uh, for agriculture already embedded it in the USDA. The new spin is if we could get that program under the Farm Bill and completely get it out of the immigration minefield, it may be a lot better way to skin the cat. Thank you, Bruce. Um, and I, I certainly uh, appreciate that. Um, I think there will be folks who, I mean, that is something I've heard as well, and it's, and it's good to know that, that's, um, and that the Farm Bureau is uh, talking about that as well. I've heard a little bit out here, but, um, you know, in, in many ways, you know, like any good organization, the uh, Farm Bureau is kind of a, an incubator in the state, and then those ideas move out. Um, you know, I'd say that Part of the immigration minefield, as it always has been, is being able to take all the discrete issues that folks need addressed in the immigration context and finding a way actually to get Congress to consider them discreetly. And a similar way of saying that is Congress has had a difficult time walking and chewing gum on all these individual issues because there's always a fear from both sides that if one of them gets addressed and another one doesn't get addressed and then perhaps another one doesn't get addressed. And the agriculture always is victim to um, a lot of this dynamic because it's the one that most people, I would say, seem to agree on that we've had very tangible policy proposals for. Um, so while I would say that certainly everyone's going to be open-minded about what the, the final um, sort of nature of the farm bill is and and certainly, like it, you know, you mentioned the Gang of Eight, and um, that had the guest worker program housed at the Department of Agriculture, and that had broad support. Um, so it's definitely not something that folks are um, by any means allergic to. But I would say that I don't think actually it, it, that escapes the underlying um, dynamic in that um, it will just become it could potentially become harder to pass the overall bill if. Uh, if labor politics and guest worker politics are entered into the farm bill. So it's kind of like, you can look at it a couple of different ways. You could be, you could look at it as uh, moving a difficult issue into the feel-good environment of the farm bill, or you could, or you could look at it as um, inserting a very difficult issue into a, a bill that, while typically feel-good, now doesn't feel so good. Um, and so I don't, 
I don't think necessarily is a, unfortunately, a, a panacea for, um, for, for addressing this issue, but I think there's going to be a lot of folks who, um, and I would encourage folks to be open-minded about ultimately what the, uh, the bill looks like. And so I appreciate you, um, you know, passing that along, and I, I suspect that we'll be hearing probably more about that going forward. All righty, thank you. Back here behind. I wasn't looking for it, so I'm going to talk. <laughs> Hi, Patty Snyder with USDA for Old Development. I have no opinion on any of this, and I'm not here to express an opinion, but I'm just listening. But um, one of the things I would recommend to all of you while you're working with your congressional staff is what I tell our applicants and the people that I work with, with when they're talking about government, because it can be so broad and so big, when, and your concerns are so large, is name that tune. I think what Robbie LaValle did was come up and say, okay, this was an issue, this is a, and she named the situation. And when you're <coughs> talking to your congressman or your staffers, please say, this is the line item. This is the language that's the problem. Because I have been able to make changes in our organization in Washington because applicants who are having problems with our programs, I get them to drill down to the language that's the problem. And then we can make changes. But it's really hard for staffer or people that work in government to make changes when we're talking big picture broad things. So I just really encourage you guys that have the knowledge and work with the programs to drill down to the specific language that is the problem for you. Thank you. Okay. Oops, turn me off. Um, let's see. Harry. Yeah, another question. Once again, I got a question for the senator's office. I, it's my understanding that behind military, the USDA is the second largest part of the federal budget. If not, it's right in there. With, with the debt structure the way it is right now, where, where does the Ag Committee see themselves as making some self-imposed cuts? I mean, it, we cannot be everything to everybody, and, and if we don't address debt in this country somehow, in every facet of it, we're not going to we're not going to last. So where does where does the ag committee see where they could you know step up and say you know what these are some cuts we can we can impose on ourselves rather than have it be a debate uh, between the agencies. And secondly, of course, Patty's comment about the language. That's exactly why we want the venue, Patty, so we can talk specific language and not have it go over the top of everybody's head. We can't generalize and get anything done. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, on the budget, you know, the, to use an example um, from the last farm bill, you know, we saved about $23 billion from agriculture. And agriculture, by the way, overall, and certainly this doesn't exempt us from conversations about fiscal responsibility and making sure that we are as efficient as possible with taxpayer resources, but it is actually about a rather small uh, section of the budget. And so, um, you know, as, as much as agriculture can and should, um, you know, sort of, uh, you know, be mindful of and be very judicious with its resources, it will not solve, of course, the underlying you know question of, of our larger budget dynamic. But when it comes to things like sequestration, you know, like agriculture is very much subject to that. And last time around, what we did was we took proportionate cuts out of um, basically all the major pockets of spending within agriculture. Is a way of putting it. So we saved money on crop insurance and commodity programs. And the biggest cut um, to that was eliminating uh, what you all may recall our direct payments. And these were payments issued to farmers kind of regardless of economic need. They were just based on what you're growing and how much you're growing of it. Um, and so that was the way we saved a lot of money in that context. And um, in addition, uh, we saved some money on uh, the conservation title. And um, you know, that, that primarily came from PRP. And it, it, that cut correlated with how much demand there was for the program at that time. So they kind of trimmed it off the top. Um, that was a it's where we cut a lot of money, and we also cut a lot of money out of uh, nutrition programs. And we did that through uh, primarily efficiencies. And by efficiencies, I mean the way the uh, SNAP program, or food stamps, 
some of you may recall, and how that interacts with other assistance programs and making sure that there weren't folks who were um, sort of uh, unfairly uh, leveraging one particular assistance program in order to make a better case under SNAP. That didn't actually affect Colorado as much in that our system doesn't allow the particular um, sort of heating deduction that other states um, were taking advantage of, but nevertheless for the country was a, a rather significant savings. And so we kind of took, those are the three really big pots of agriculture spending. And um, I, I, just because that's where all the money is, you can anticipate that budget debates going forward will involve those three pots of money as well. And so that's something to look out for is, that's if, if there's gonna be savings, that's where it's coming from. All right. Um. And Harry, we can keep talking about this. You know, I will. Uh, we're as we're starting this conversation now in part because we know that a lot of folks in the ag community are going to get really busy pretty soon here, and or I'm sorry, in the ag community. And we want to make sure that we are, you know, get making sure that everyone has time to kind of have their voices heard from the get go. Um, some aspects of this conversation, I think we're going to have much more time for, and and it's going to be a much longer process. But again, we're we're trying to start early, so um, I think we're going to have time to figure this, some of this stuff out and figure out what the right venues are to. To, to hear from everybody, and um, this is just the beginning. Um, and uh, I, I will just say thank you all for taking the time, and thanks Grant and Lee for being on. Um, and uh, I think you'll all be seeing, you, there'll all be future opportunities to, to connect with us on this, and, and don't ever hesitate to reach out as well if you're if you're not hearing from us. So. All righty, do we have, Jay Paul, do we have one burning quick question? Um, this is probably off of the farm bill, and I think uh, I don't think the farm bill is really the most important issue that's facing agriculture right now. I, I believe uh, you know, that there are some other things, some regulatory things, um, and you know I'd like to see you know if agriculture is going to survive, we need young people in agriculture. Uh, I think the average age of uh, farmers and ranchers is uh, just a barely a little bit younger than I am. I have two sons in their 30s that would like to get into agriculture. They are in, in our uh, agriculture uh, operations, but we are being attacked by environmental groups, radical environmental groups. Uh, personally, we're being attacked by uh, the Rocky Mountain Bighorn Society and uh, the backcountry uh, hunters and anglers on, on our allotments. Um, and uh, you know there were, I think, ten uh, allotments that were attacked and, and uh, by the uh, Western Watersheds. Um, they lost that uh, suit. They sued the Forest Service, but those ranchers had to put up a hundred thousand dollars to fight that. We're going to have to put up money to to fight uh, to just get the Forest Service. Uh, you know, to protect the Forest Service, they're going to. Sue the, sue the Forest Service, we're going to have to go in with the Forest Service. They're trying to bully the Forest Service to take our allotments away. Uh, they're using access to justice. They're using our tax dollars to do that. And we, we you know, if you want a, uh, agriculture to survive on the western slope, uh, then we better stop this kind of stuff. All righty, thank you. Um, as you can tell, there's lots and lots of issues um, from the from the ag community, and, and I know we could just continue on and on. And so, um, certainly, I was just whispering to Noah. I got some other issues to do with you, <laughs> so, but but we're out of time. So thank you so much. Really appreciate Grant you joining us, and and Lee, thanks for for joining us on the call. Looking forward to working with you and and Noah and um, Julie. Thank you so much for being here. Really appreciate it. So. If you get these Thank you for All right, the fun part. So, Robbie, would you please come and join me? <laughs> I've been feeling lonely up here without you. So, we'll start into the resolution process. Um, actually, you know what, just for while Robbie's coming up here, they're really. Um, Brian, I did. Sorry, I was kind of overlooking you. Do you have. Do you want to come back in a minute? Yeah. So just, okay. All right. So um, we we'll go through some of the resolutions, and I did want to quickly um, before we do adjourn. I don't want to get away without um, hearing a little bit from um, Brian Meinhart, um with Congressman Tipton's office. So 
We will start on the resolution process. We'll just go down the list that's on the agenda, if that's okay, Nicole. Okay. Um, I'm assuming that's how they're in the packet. Is that how they're in the packet? Yes, ma'am. Awesome.
um, on the point, this is wordsmithing, but on the point where it says Club 20 believes USDA field offices are crucial to the economy and opposes proposals to close them. So appreciate that support. But in a time of sequestration, what happened last time is that when we have across the board budget cuts and you have fixed costs and you have variable costs, your fixed costs are your rent on your offices and your variable costs are your people. So if you can't cut the rent on your offices, then you lose, like say you're doing a 10% across the board and you can't cut your fixed costs, then you do a 40% cut in staffing. And that's really what you want is the field services. So what I would encourage you to say is something along the lines of Club 20 believes that USDA field services are crucial to the economy and, propose, and opposes proposals to reduce services to rural areas and leave it at that. And then don't name the offices. to uh, review these regulations and who will be doing it if we ask this question. Uh, I think it'll make a lot of difference who reviews it and figures out what's going to stay in there or not. Do we have an idea of whom we are asking to do it? Review by who? new director, trying to get them to focus on these regulations. Stick the word by in there after the call. Do you have another question? So normally, I mean, the regulators should be once reevaluating the regulations with the oversight of the elected officials. And that's, I mean, that's how it works at the county level. That's the way it should work at the federal level as well. Those regulators should go do a thorough analysis of their own regulations and be able to justify that from a zero base. So, Doug, I, so are you thinking this? This new language here should or should not be in there. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure either way, but I, you know, I guess I, I'm all right with you know the, a complete review of the regu uh, regulations by those regulating. And, uh, I mean, so that includes the oversight by the elected officials of those uh, departments. You could just say, including the Office of Management and Budget, and that would yeah. add address your yeah. There you go. Okay. Oh, again, back here. So, again, even some of these regulations are state regulations as well. So, I mean, those are ones we need to be concerned with as well. And, and when Governor Hickenlooper first got in, I mean, uh, Colorado counties were very aggressive on him to have all of his departments go through and reevaluate every one of his regulations and to ask whether those things were still relevant and, and uh, have a uh, review of those things to make sure that they still made sense, that they still were needed in, in place. Madam Chairman, without making a motion and confusing it, I'd like the committee to consider maybe sending this back and have it rewritten as a 
ag programs for federal and then separated ag programs for state. There are apples and oranges and there's a lot of ways where we should be resolving uh, to solve state issues versus resolving to solve federal issues. So you want to make that motion? I would move that we send this back. Send it back to who? I say send it back to the committee. Here we are. <laughs> so I don't know where we well, go to. Well, I, I just think the language is general and confusing because of it, it covers both agencies. So as I'm just putting it out there for, for discussion right now without the motion, that uh, we consider a separate one for state and a separate one for federal. Originally, and I could be wrong on this. Originally, as I read it, I think it's, it's it is very it is general, but it gives staff and us the opportunity to kind of push back on on um, regulation. I guess to say. Um, so, like I say, I, I may have read that wrong because I read it really early this morning, really quick. So could we, in that first part, say uh, review of regulations um, at both the state and federal level by appropriate agencies? Because um, I do think there is some strength in actually having them both in the same uh, resolution. Um, so if you just said state and federal agencies? That's a possibility. Mm Another, okay, so are we, if we're good with number one, does that make sense for you guys back here, number one? I mean, we're, we're talking, it is very general, and it's each and every agency, not asking any one particular agency, because we're talking about so much different regular laws. There's a lot to review on that, I'm sure, but I just question who is going to be making the decision on it, is my question, I don't know. So I guess is what I'm thinking that this does is again, if there is a particular piece that we identify that needs to be addressed, then this is broad enough that it gives us the ability to say to any one of those state or federal level agencies, you need to review this. So it just makes it broad enough, it gives a lot of authority. Does that make sense to others? Okay. Down to, yeah. on this one? Yeah, I, grammatically it's not quite right, but I would ask that, that this, you know, the staff look at that and get it, get it right. I, okay, yeah, we don't need to absolutely words, but I'm comfortable with that too. <laughs> okay, so we'll work on the grammatical part. Anything else on this bullet number one? <coughs> okay, we could drop down to bullet, the last bullet, and just where you inserted the part that I had given you, Nicole. Yes. To, so, to assist young farmers and ranchers, let's see, okay. you may have it in the wrong spot. I would always say new rather than young. <laughs> Young is a relative term, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we, is, that, is that right? Yes, sir. 
Just real quickly on that one, it says better funding, but it doesn't really specify what the better funding is for. Is it for the beginning or new farm or rancher programs or, or what? If you put that better funding right, it supports an expansion and better funding of the da da da. Yeah. term over here rather than better how about increased funding or at least consistent little piece that I in just again quickly reviewing it in the very in the second line we might consider adding after open space and wildlife habitat does that make sense in there where it says uh, where's the rate of open space you want to say open space and productive farmlands or open space and productive ranch lands it, it sounds a little bit like it's just random open space as opposed to open productive space land. that's already in productive production okay so if we just said open space and productive land so on the second whereas would you be uh, open to saying working landscapes? Yeah, whatever. Yeah. I, I just I think it's, it's just too vague being just open yeah. space. Our prairie dog has a great definition of productive land, but it's different than mine. <laughs> yeah, and open spaces. All right. <laughs> what was that, Mr. Robbie? I'm sorry. Working landscapes. There you go. Thanks. In the third one, we, we talked about development in the second one, and we say urbanization in the third one, so I'm not sure urbanization and development are the exact same things, which one we want to be clear on. I, 
I think it's gotten thinner now with just development, but um, I'd rather say urbanization on both of us, or urbanization and subdivision, or something like that. Yeah, I think it's <laughs> Because urbanization, I think, brings to mind a high density of things, whereas just dividing into 35 acres might be something. Like yeah, or residential development. Residential development. Like that. It's just something more clear than just development. Is there, uh, is there other kinds of development They're that aren't urbanization? That the word well, I think resident, residential development is the primary. They is that the point of this? Yeah. Is that that okay. Would, would a word like fragmented, fragmented You can say residential and other developments. I like that. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Is and then you can use just the development in the second paragraph, and it's more referred to. Okay. In the essence of time, are we okay to move forward with this one? I think you're on uh, the wrong line unless you're calling into the Club 20 Agriculture meeting. Um, what's an agricultural plan unit development? Yeah. <coughs> I tried to look that up and didn't really come up with anything, so I was curious as well. I, I moved that that, that bullet be the. Oh, let me try to set that. So we've got it there. So for discussion, Yes. yes. Um, generally, a planned unit development means that a zoning board is going to allow you greater variances than their normal code would allow. It allows all sorts of variances. And it's generally something that the property, always something, excuse me, that the property owner has to apply for and wants. It's not something that's placed on you. But people can come in with their property all sorts of ways in different counties with different codes and say, I'd like to build five residential homes over here. I'd like my ag facilities here. I'd like these zonings, which is not currently, and it gives the county more flexibility. But again, it's just something that people apply for and want to use as a tool to protect or subdivide or pass along their lands to their children, things like that. It's not something that is placed on someone. So I, I, it, that's just a tool in the toolbox that some ag users may want to use to protect their lands and have it zoned appropriately. And just to add, if there's a time frame on that, which a lot of times there is a specific time frame on a planned unit development, it'll default back to its previous zoning. Yeah. So if it's originally zoned ag and mm -hmm. nothing happens with the land or the land gets sold or something of that nature, it defaults back to ag. Okay. So right now what we have is a motion to delete the third bullet and a second with that discussion. Any other discussion? Um, yes. Yeah, I think my thing was the way it's capitalized. It sounds like it is something specific. And if you look up agricultural planning and development, nothing comes up. And I've, we've done a lot of planning and developments in the county, so I think it just needs to be um, maybe not capitalized or <laughs> Um, because, because it is a useful tool that, yeah. that should be available, but it just, like I say, it seemed like it was referring to something specific that's, that it could be. That's awesome. Okay, so Doug? So, so our county has a land preservation subdivision, and it's a land preservation subdivision exemption. It goes back to Senate Bill 35. It's a one allowance of one unit for every 35 acres that's on it, but allows them to downsize that, that lot down to uh, five acres so that we're still preserving the integrity of the, the, the mass of the ranching or agriculture land and still allowing a rancher and farmer to be able to subdivide and be able to capitalize on some of the land. And I don't know how we can talk about this whole thing without having some inference in here into uh, land use as well and our local regulations that each county would have based on their local aspirations of what they want to have. So 
again, I struggle through here. We're trying to save ag at the same point in time. We're struggling with saving ag at the same point in time, allowing agriculture operators to be able to uh, capitalize on, uh, we, we're talking about it on conservation easements on it as well. So this is just another tool, as Rachel says, to be able to allow a rancher to be able to sell off five acres, even though we have a minimum 35 acre lot size. I know what a planned unit development, development is. Okay. I don't know what an agricultural planned unit development is. And, and so, you know, I, I, I just don't think that this belongs here. Um, I mean, you, it, and if you want to talk about uh, planning issues that would help to uh, prevent urban sprawl, I've got a little amendment do that, but I, I don't know what an agriculture plan unit development is. So that's why I made the motion. Okay. So when, so more, oh, more discussion? Oh, yeah, just briefly, again, I guess we just had the vote on the motion, right. but I, I would just say uh, it, it's different in every single county, as counties adopt their, their own rules, and those are your elected representatives, and in general, the purpose is to create something that people can apply to if they want to use it because it's beneficial to them. It is not a zoning overlay. It's not something that's forced on anyone. It just becomes a tool for greater variances, frankly, and allowances to that property owner. So, it, you know, whether it's in here or not, I guess they'll still continue on, but this is trying to discuss the tools that ag users can use, can take advantage of, similar to conservation easements on their land or other things. So, I, 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 it's not an imposed. It says to consider the option and determine whether it can be useful for your property. Uh, I, I just don't see it as harmful. And I would just say maybe make it more generic and say that yes. we consider the option of various zoning tools, including planning and developments, etc. Um, to and I think it's you know to help preserve the rural agricultural nature of our landscape. Maybe that's where you're going, Jayfall. Yes, my yes. comment is my comment is that maybe we just could say that we respect private property rights. Yeah, respecting private property rights can be popped right in there. But it's a tool. There is the, um, excuse me, there is the rural cluster subdivision that's established in Colorado statutes that Stop. allows for the preservation of lands including under number one, it says to preserve areas of lands which are suitable for agriculture, forestry, open space, and when applied in a rural urban transition area, possible future development. Last, but it's a one per 35 acre density. Um, does allow you to cluster all the way down to whatever your minimum size is for septic, without bringing in tremendous amounts of utility and sewer. And that's in place, and that may be what we want to encourage because it is really already in, in place and it's out. It's it's the outside of the going back in and, and doing a whole zone change and and or planning development where you have to have a much more comprehensive process. So I, I just think that the, the people decide the tools in those counties have to you know. So Nicole, on your um, not such as property. So various zoning tools um, recognizing property. Respecting. Right. Respecting, thank you. Private property rights. Um, okay, so then, and then maybe not taking out. I would draw a motion that that can would pass this piece. Okay, so is the second okay with withdrawing that motion? Okay, motion withdrawn. <laughs> okay, if we're doing this right. Okay, so now we... I like private property rights. <laughs> I knew if we get that word in there, we'd be good. But do we have it worded right is the question. Uh, the, the last thing I would add to that then is that various uh, state and local zoning tools, as the gentleman was pointing out, there's state laws, and then there's additional overlays uh, that grant more to, to communities. So uh, using both state and local zoning tools. <coughs> Say a little bit of word which tool would be most useful. Something like that. Yeah, the most useful tools. To utilize the most useful tools. And this is encouraging.
encouraging the counties, so yes. the counties need to have the regulations and the individual people would be choosing the tool. So it might be the, the counties um, consider <coughs> option of various state and local zoning tools respecting private properties um, that allow individuals the most flexibility in yeah. attaining or agriculture. To create the most useful tools in their area. I think we should change useful to appropriate. Sure. Okay. 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 Chairman, we move to adopt the resolution. As second. Okay. So second. Motion by Jeff, second by Rachel. All those in favor, say aye. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't do the. I, the, I just wanted to, up there in the, uh, we're talking about the options. Do we really want local, local governments to consider respecting private property an option? It seems to me that we <laughs> want to consider that. Not an option, but mandatory. Okay, we'll go back and look at that. <laughs> the I think the respecting private property rights actually is, is referring to the, op the options. They all have to respect private property rights. Maybe if we just put while, or all the while respect private respect. property rights or something. You're the attorney. <laughs> okay. yeah, it, it can be either way, but I don't think this organization generally has <laughs> taken the approach that. So that we, got it, we got it right is, there now? Is an option. Are we good now with it? Yeah. Okay, that's, that's okay. all right. All in favor say aye. Okay. All opposed, same sign. All right. We're probably going to get to three of our. Six or seven. Colorado agriculture product. Let's see. Promotion of Colorado agriculture products. Madam Chair. Okay, just a second. There was a comment back here. Oh, there. No, I'm a man in the mic. Oh, you're a man in the mic. Okay. <laughs> yes, sir. I'm going to read off AGEO 6 4. So I'm going to. Motion is second. I'm sorry, I don't know anymore. Chris. Chris, thank you. Um, any other discussion? Um, just to ask um, you guys, do you think anything about international trade belongs in this one? This sounds a little more like <coughs> state of origin, promoting Colorado products in Colorado, so I don't want to interject at the wrong point. But in terms of promotion of Colorado agriculture, it should be both uh, domestically and abroad. Or, I guess I'm still thinking if we can keep it into the ones that are specific to the international trade. Okay, maybe. I don't think I just hate because I don't think we want to lose it. I think, but just getting it in the right one up there. Okay. Any other discussion? I just have a quick question: Is some of this already been accomplished? The state procurement preference, for instance. Some, some bills that have incurred that, but that doesn't mean there can't be more. So I, I think this would allow to have to look at it and say when a bill comes up to, to encourage additional purchases, hopefully we do Okay. So I just have a question out. back here. And do you just take out creating because some are already created? Okay, let's go with the question back here behind us and we'll come back at the Yes, sir. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just for clarification under the now, uh, therefore be resolved, vote number one. Um, so this was requiring new enterprise zones to be located in rural areas and creating an interim committee to study potential new markets. Has that not been done? And do we not already have an enterprise zone administrative uh, in rural Colorado through AGNC or is that something different? Okay. 
I would say we have other regions in western Colorado outside of the AGNC territory that may or may not have enterprise zones established within them. So oh, you're saying it's still relevant? I, I think it probably is still relevant. So, I, so we have a motion on, again, go ahead, So it might be better just to remove the word requiring, but then insert in that supporting. Supporting, instead, instead of requ uh, requiring. Yeah. Yeah, so third line on Yeah, so, so it produced out of state, and then it goes requiring new enterprise zones, but supporting and maybe not even new, but just supporting enterprise zones to be located in rural areas. Friendly amendment. Thank you. And I actually might actually thank you, Nicole. You've got it highlighted. Um, the other thing was the possibility of changing that state to include public and private efforts rather than just state. Does that make sense? Is that acceptable? Yep. Okay. All right. With those changes, we have the motion on the floor to adopt this. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Okay. 06-1, future of ag in Colorado. Any concerns on it? Uh, first of all, uh, the third from the last whereas it says the average current age of current producers is 57. That should be changed to 59. Okay. <laughs> I have it underlined, but I didn't know what the number was. Okay, thank you. And then the question I had on the first be it resolved, uh, you know, calls for the creation of a task force. Is is that still relevant? Is a task force what we need to do that, or is that still what our ask should be? I don't really have the answer to it, but it, you know, I'm not sure that is exactly what we ought to be asking for. It. I'll follow up on this point for just a second. I find that really uh, very timely because having spent a couple years or more working on the state water plan, and of course its interrelationship with ag in Colorado. Um, it was often pointed out that water isn't the only problem. And it's not about solving water for ag. There's all sorts of other competitive issues, regulatory issues, and so on. And so through the water pan, people kept saying, look, if we're going to save Colorado ag, let's have a task force to determine what all the other barriers are and, and try to get that out of the water plan. That's not going to deal with all the ag problems. So I don't know that it's actually occurred or, or anything to really talk about those issues. But I think it's it's timely. So uh, yeah, thank you, Jay Paul. In in the interest of time, I know in another committee that we had, we forwarded this to what committee? I mean the advisory. The advisory advisory committee. Committee. I think this is a real weak resolution. Uh, you've got a lot of good things in the whereases. And then, therefore, be it resolved, like you don't resolve any of those issues that are in the, or very few of the issues that are in the whereas. And so, I think that I was wondering if it'd be possible to move that it go to the advisory committee. Committee. Yeah, what, what to, panel? Panel. Thank advisory you. Advisory panel. Okay. To kind of reevaluate this whole whole thing. And you're on that, right? I don't know if I'm <laughs> Where are you sitting now? <laughs> but I think that's a good answer. I resign. <laughs> so, I move to do that. Okay, there's a motion. Carries a second. Discussion? Just one comment. I agree with what J. Paul said, but maybe it would be helpful if we change that first whereas instead of saying urges creation, say strongly supports all efforts, including the task force of the move. Yeah, there you go. I, there is a Colorado blueprint for food and ag process going on right now. The next meeting is March 22nd in Durango for the Southwest region. Uh, CSU is part behind that as well as some state folks. So <coughs> progress is being made. Okay. 
So I would also just add, we might, as we, as the advisory group looks at this, look at the first one we evaluated and see if there isn't a way to combine the first one and this one into one strong one. Mm -hmm. Mary, can you say your encourage us all? You have one shot at it. I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> I think I just said that we are encouraging all efforts for assessing the future of agriculture, not limited to a task force or including but a task including force. A, yeah, including a task force. And honestly, it's just saying who create a state task force, local task force, DOLA task force. I mean, it should say what kind of task force at some level, or who, 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 what will give it heft after they complete their work. Okay. So we have the motion on the floor to refer it. We've got our notes. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed? All right. So we are at our time frame. We have one, two, three more that need to be addressed. What's the wishes of the committee? These, these are pretty, um, they're the in, um, international free trade which are quite timely. Do you want to spend some time on them? Do you want to adjourn and um, address them next time? Madam Chairman? Yes, sir. I would say gee, these two on trade need a whole lot of work, need to be completely rewritten. I don't know if it's appropriate for the committee to do that or where the proper action work take place, but it's I'm not sure we're going to have the time to do it today by any means, but uh, I guess probably the correct thing would be to refer to the, to the advisory committee to rebate it. We would probably make, possibly be able to combine the two into one trade resolution and, and uh, try to get one rather than these two, which are both, in my okay. case, very important. Okay. I second that. I think that's appropriate. And Christian, you still have the, the framework then to keep continuing to push and push at the federal level that absolutely okay okay so as we've got a, a motion and a second harry seconded it oh, no, oh sorry <coughs> Eric did. um so all of those in favor say aye aye, aye. aye. all opposed i think we definitely will that was one of the notes i had is the possibility of combining them and rachel your um statement that it was concerned should we put that into our notes too that you had yeah, in that the, earlier the, the trade that uh, we're concerned about uh, damaging colorado's agricultural trade through renegotiation of trade deals or other political ventures <laughs> we, <laughs> we want to make sure that ag doesn't become the mitigation tool yeah, yeah. Well, or take a hit you know yes. take the retaliatory hit okay jay paul uh, madam chair on ag-06-6 I move that we, we readopt. Second. Motion is second by Jeff. On 06 6, discussion. We have a question. I have a discussion. Okay. It was here in fact. Okay, back here. Just, just a simple discussion. Um, something that really relates to this that I was involved in in the last two farm, three farm bills, um, was looking at it, it sort of relates. This really relates to the Endangered Species Act by and large, really because of the, the way the land is really taken out of production by designation. One of the things, the tools that hasn't happened is to have a safe harbor agreement. One of the reasons that much of the sagebrush issue was tamped down and there's an interim resolution to it was because of ranchers and farmers making investments in ha critical habitat development to demonstrate that they could they have no safe harbor. They have no assurances that sometime in the future all those investments. So I think it ought to be consideration here is that Club 20 ought to consider about it. It's timely for Senator Bennett to be on the Ag Committee and the Farm Bill to look at safe harbor agreements as a tool to protect against future takings by Resolute Bible. Essentially, we've invested through federal programs, USDA programs, EQIP, in critical habitat, and yet there's no protection that that's not going to go backwards. I think it's just, I would add that as the discussion and consideration. I'll follow up on that. Uh, we have a safe harbor resolution specifically. Oh, okay. So that I'm might talking. be something worth looking at to see if it needs updated, but I, but I know that there's one out there because I, I happen to know the guy that wrote it. Okay. 
<laughs> so did you do a good job? I, I don't. That's what I don't know. It need. It may need reviewed. But, but I don't disagree with you at all that the that the uh, um, resolution that this resolution deals a lot with endangered species, but it also deals with state and federal regulations like we dealt with a little bit earlier. And so that's actually the reason that I, I don't have a problem adopting this, Gene Paul. I, I would. I, I seconded your motion because I was going to. I was just about to make the motion myself because this the point of this really is that any devaluation of property value is a takings, whether it's for rules, regulations, or endangered species act issues. So two cents. More discussion? Yeah. Quickly? Without yes, quickly. <laughs> Sorry. Without adding to it, maybe I'll we'll bring it up, but prior to this Part of the takings that are going on is we're getting a net, lo net loss of private landholders. And takings, in my opinion, should be broadened to uh, national uh, parks and uh, habitat protection by the Division of Wildlife and these simple transfers of water rights. Those are all takings. And that language should be in something like this because it ultimately affects agriculture and affects private property. So I have, I have a comment back here and being the commissioner and being involved in a couple of those situations. I mean, the Supreme Court law, case law, doesn't support partial takings that much. So I mean, it's a big hurdle, uh, partial takings. And uh, so, I mean, we've, I mean, even local zoning and, and land use regulations can be take, uh, put as a partial taking. So, I mean, I, I'm just careful where we tread here because I mean, our local land use regulations are also related to those partial takings. Okay. Yes. I'm not really sure, but I think we'd make this stronger if we just took out the word unreasonable this takings period, or, un or just diminished period, on that last uh, bullet of, under the uh, order resolve. Just take out unreasonably. Leaves that diminished any diminished value of property should be considered. Friendly amendment. Okay. All righty. That all in favor? Can I have a question? Um, what if that diminished property value comes from a private property, a, a neighboring property where it's not a public um, <laughs> issue? That's not a regulation. And, and did we include any of the wording on the other takings? Because I couldn't support what Perry was saying, National Parks and things. some of the sentiments that we're putting out there, uh, there's such a thing as the givings <laughs> when government creates more value in your property, either by investment in assets and roads and other infrastructure that creates value and potentially up zones property. Uh, but, you know, we have to look at that quite honestly. If, if you have property and someone else is now, we've zoned you for some more noxious use immediately next door, those property owners may see a diminishment in their resale values of their homes or their properties. And is that a takings because you've now zoned someone to have a, a, a new pig farm next to a residential neighborhood? Do, do, we, we, do we need to then pay the private property owners because you allow the rezoning next door to them? I, I think you just have to really think a little bit about what the courts have said is allowed as a regulation for orderly development of communities. And it, it's been upheld. That's the reason you have planning and zoning boards. So not everything the government does is a takings. Okay. So we've got a motion on the floor. And we... Oh, okay. One on. If I'm reading this right, it says federal takings. That's not your county or your zoning. Is that right? It yes. says federal regulatory action. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And Jay Paul gave a good example of that. We have the right to do things, but the regulations that are coming in are putting us out of business. And a uh, man from Mount County also said that the Supreme Court upholds our private property rights, but you spent two or three hundred thousand dollars to get that right. 
and not too many farmers and ranchers can afford that and stay in business. Okay. Thank you for noting the federal regulatory piece. All right, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Aye. aye. I think we're passed. You <laughs> got a question? <laughs> okay, passed. You gotta do the hands? Okay, all in favor raise your right hand. It's kind of the same thing. They will put out a, a solicitation for feedback from the various members. So please do let us know what your thoughts are, and we can relay those along to the uh, uh, to the committee as appropriate. So, and um, kind of going into just to give you a little foray for the uh, business affairs committee later on, uh, like Rob was touching on, I do have some updates on access to capital for small businesses, which incorporates, uh, I think, ag significantly into that. But uh, I'll, I'll save that for a later committee since we're a little overdue. So. Thank you. Besides encouraging your baby to stay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, Anna. I didn't even see you come in. Hi. Yeah, we'll watch that. <laughs> coming. All righty. With that, we will adjourn. Thank you guys very much. Let's start.
Opening.